Well, I'm originally from Santa Cruz, Bolivia. Uh, I have been in the United States for about 12 years now. I was born in Caleras, or Zacatecas, Mexico, and I've been here for about nine years. I was born in El Salvador, Metapana, El Salvador, and I've been in the United States about, about seven to eight years. I was born in Mexico in a really, really small town, and I came here in 2004. I was born in Mexico, Durango, Mexico. I've uh, been living in the United States for five years already. As far as when I was in high school, when I started applying for colleges, when uh, licenses came up, when trips came up, that's when I started to realize the impact of what my situation really was. I can't do the same things as everyone else. I can't visit people that I miss. I can't do things at school like everybody else. Two of the biggest challenges I face as an undocumented student is the first one is not having my license, having to find rights to get from point A to point B, and the second one is uh, having to pay out-of-state tuition, which is really hard on me because I basically have to pay twice as much. You get a, you get a scholarship, and then when they ask you just to, to fill that out, we use Social Security, and then you say no, they say, oh, I'm sorry and it's a full scholarship. Just because I came to the United States when I was 13 years old, that, that doesn't make me a criminal. Some people don't even know that we exist. Some people don't even know that we are here. Some people don't know our struggles. I've seen my brother go through problems of not being able to do anything. And I'm pretty sure it's gonna be the same for me. It's really hard, like, to live with a lot of closed doors and trying to find one open. Moving here without your mother, your dad, it's just, it was one of the hardest experiences because I can do anything. I'm basically living in the shadows. It's one of those things that you learn to live with, but not that, that you're never okay with, ever. You're, you're never okay with just, you know, saying like, oh, you know, it's fine. I work, I work just as hard, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I, w I just want the chance to, to let the world see my potential. And the United States, the, the American society to notice that we're not just uneducated people. We are educated people that want to contribute to your society. We don't want to get educated over here and go back to the country. I don't want to go back to Mexico. I don't have a, I don't have a life in Mexico. My life is here. I, I am an immigrant. I, I grew up here. I, if I go to Bolivia, what am I going to do? I don't, I don't know Bolivia. Bolivia's it's a faraway land, like, it's my parents' homeland. It is my home. There's no, I don't have any other home than America or the United States. I've lived here almost half of my life already. Um, I've been raised basically with the uh, American culture, so yes, I do think of myself as, as Amer American. I love the United States. I love the philosophy. I love how we, everybody's free. And I'm gonna say it like this, because I don't think that everybody is free in the United States. The country should let people that actually try to try to give us documents so we can do better in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the University of Arkansas Vice Provost for Global Campus, Dr. Javier Antonio Reyes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. I am Javier Reyes, Associate Dean for Undergrad Programs in the Walton College and Vice Provost for Distance Education. I want to thank you all for coming out to support tonight's panel discussion, Undocumented Living in the Shadows. 
Let me also welcome those watching this event on the web. We appreciate your interest. There are an estimated 11.5 million undocumented immigrants living in the United States. 2.5 million of these are young adults or children. Every year, 65,000 young adults graduate from American high schools. And they face, a se they face serious impediments to further their education. Tonight's panel is an attempt to, att it's an attempt to deepen the national dialogue on undocumented immigration by engaging the voices of those who usually prefer to remain silent, those of the undocumented immigrants themselves. All of our panelists are undocumented immigrants. Clearly, speaking out represents great personal risk for themselves and their families. But many undocumented immigrants have reached the point where the risk of speaking out outweigh the benefits of remaining quiet. They need to be heard if we're going to advance the dialogue on immigration. The person most responsible for tonight's discussion is also tonight's host and moderator. Dave Gerhardt was appointed chancellor of the University of Arkansas in July of 2008. He faced an immediate crisis when the Arkansas Department of Higher Education informed the university that it would be required to check social security numbers of all incoming students. Ultimately, 19 University of Arkansas students were, forced, were told that they could no longer pay in-state tuition because they did not have a social security number. Despite graduating from Arkansas high schools and being academically qualified. In his Plyer versus Doe opinion, Supreme Court Justice William Brennan wrote, legislation directing the honors of a parent's misconduct against his children does not comport with fundamental, com fu does not comport with fundamental conceptions of justice. Yet that's the situation that those students and millions like them face every day. Rather than impose the unfair burden of outstate tuition on in-state students, Chancellor Gerhardt led efforts to, to find private funding to pay for the difference for this tuition. He has been an outspoken advocate for immigration reforms ever since. Please help me welcome Chancellor G. David Gerhardt. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, you're very kind, and thank you, Javier. I want to thank everybody here tonight for coming. Regardless of the position you take on this very serious issue, we are glad that you are here, and we're glad that you want to learn more about this vital issue affecting our state and nation. I want to take this opportunity to thank University Relations for producing that outstanding and genuinely heartbreaking video we just saw. I also want to thank the brave men and women, the young people who agreed to appear on it and to share their stories. I was certainly moved by their plight and the challenges they face, and I'm sure you were. Let me also take this opportunity to thank three people for helping us get here tonight. The first is our Associate Vice Chancellor for University Relations, John Diamond, and our Vice Chancellor for University Advancement, Brad Choate. They are the two people who worked very hard to put this entire evening together. And I also want to thank somebody who early on took a position on this most important issue, who encouraged all of us at the university to follow it closely and do what we could to help, and that is the Dean of our Honors College, Dr. Bob McMath. From the beginning, he has been a great advocate for this cause, and I want him to know how much I sincerely appreciate his support. Might I ask all three of these gentlemen to please stand and be recognized. Now, I think the video sets the stage for what we are trying to do this evening, and that is to get past the statistics and the numbers that 
perhaps cloud public discussion on undocumented immigration and really drill down to the real life experiences of those that are involved. It is a controversial topic, to be sure, that inflames passions, incites anger, and affects millions of lives. There are not any easy solutions, not when so many deep-seated feelings are involved. Still, we cannot dismiss the issue before us. We have to deal with it. We have to speak to it. What we hope to do is to better humanize the undocumented life, as well as the costs and consequences of being undocumented in America, often for reasons beyond the immigrant's control. We hope to better illuminate the daily struggles of those who are trapped between their parents' desire to give them a better life and a legal system that does not recognize them as citizens of this country, even after years and years of assimilation and enculturation. As an institution of higher learning, we believe that it is our duty to address topics of regional, national, and global significance, and even when the topic may invite a great deal of controversy. I was asked by some through email and phone messages and texts to cancel this event tonight. And I have to tell you that the possibility of doing that never even remotely was considered. We are an educational institution that has a responsibility to educate and inform the public of social and political issues that affect our nation and our state. As a land-grant institution, we see this as an important public service. As you know, there are a multitude of legal, social, educational, cultural, economic, policy, and political issues related to the presence of almost 12 million undocumented immigrants currently living in the United States, many of whom came here through no volition of their own, but were brought here by their parents. And let me say that holding tonight's event has, and I think it's important that you know this, invoked outrage in some quarters. Some communi communications that we have received have been angry, mean-spirited, and frankly, rude. Some have been hateful and even threatening. Many show terrible ignorance of the real issues. No one should be afraid or opposed to hearing all sides of an issue that is so much in the public domain. I believe that the very tenets of our nation, in fact, demand such. Our great country is based on the hallowed principles of free speech and assembly as cherished rights. I would hope that all Americans would at least agree with this basic constitutional premise and support our guaranteed right and privilege to hold this gathering. Let me be clear, the University of Arkansas does not condone illegal immigration. As an individual, however, I and many of my associates at the university do support immigration reform, and I am personally an advocate of the DREAM Act. Now, tonight's discussion may touch on the DREAM Act, certainly it will, but it is not our primary focus. Our focus is squarely on the millions of lives affected by undocumented immigration as revealed through the experiences of our six panelists. We have a number of people to thank for making this panel possible, not the least of whom are our panelists who will be introduced momentarily. As a university, we frequently deal with the questions of undocumented immigration, both academically and practically. We have leaned on three outstanding scholars in particular who I want to introduce to you tonight. 
The first is Dr. William Schwab, the former Dean of Fulbright College, a distinguished sociology professor, and a person who has studied the issue intensely as it relates to Northwest Arkansas and beyond. We believe he is one of the top people in the country that deals with this issue. And I'd like you to recognize Dr. Schwab tonight. Dr. Schwab, would you please stand? Another is Professor Elizabeth Young, who is the founding director of the School of Law's Immigration Clinic, which advises and assists potential immigrants through the process of attaining citizenship. She has provided outstanding leadership, advice, and good counsel on this issue. Professor Young, would you please stand? And I also want to recognize the dean of our law school, Stacy Leeds. She has provided very important guidance, expertise, and support on this issue from day one. Dean Leeds, would you please stand? Let me also take this opportunity to thank the Vice Provost for Diversity Affairs, Dr. Charles Robinson, and Assistant Vice Provost for Diversity Affairs, Dr. Luis Restrepo, for all their efforts to move this conversation forward. Gentlemen, would you please stand and be recognized? We also have with us tonight a real champion in this cause, and that is Maria uh, Reith, Maria Reith, excuse me, Executive Director of the Arkansas United Community Coalition. We thank you for your excellent help in planning this discussion. Would you please stand and be recognized, Ms. Reith? <laughs> now, from day one, our students were extraordinarily excited and supportive of holding this event tonight. And I want to particularly thank Michael Dodd and the entire Associated Student Government of the University of Arkansas for leading the way in promoting tonight's event. And I would like to ask Michael, all the officers of ASG, and all the members of that organization, if you would please stand and let us thank you for your support. Now, we have a number of members of the General Assembly with us tonight, and we thank you, our elected officials, for being with us this evening. If you are currently or have ever been an elected official, not just members of the General Assembly, but anyone in an elected office, I hope you will please stand and let us thank you for being here to learn about this most important subject. Please, any elected officials, would you please stand? Thank you. We're particularly pleased that we have representative from, representatives from the governor's office, Cericia Cole and Francine Herrera. They are here representing the governor, and I am deeply grateful to them for their presence. Would you please stand and let us thank you. Thank you. Finally, it is my fervent hope that tonight's assembly will better educate you on the serious issues and pitfalls facing the youth of our state and our nation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's meet tonight's panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening's program features six individuals who offer both common and unique perspectives on growing up in America, but not as Americans. Our first panelist was brought to the United States from Mexico when she was six years old. She now lives in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Please welcome Isabel Castillo. Our second panelist was born in Peru. His parents brought him to the United States when he was a child. He grew up in Rogers, Arkansas, and continues to reside in Northwest Arkansas. Please welcome Jonathan Chavez.
Our third panelist was born in Mexico. Her parents brought her to the United States when she was three years old. She grew up in Bentonville and still resides there. Please welcome Zesna Garcia. Our fourth panelist was brought to the United States from Peru when he was a child. He grew up in Massachusetts and still lives there. Please welcome to the stage, Carlos Saavedra. Our next panelist was born in Mexico City. Her parents brought her to the United States when she was five years old. She grew up and lives in Dequeen, Arkansas. Please welcome Rosa Velasquez. Our sixth panelist grew up in Brooklyn, New York. His parents brought him to the United States from Mexico when he was five years old. Please welcome Cesar Vargas. Well, thank you to all of our panelists for being here tonight. We're grateful to you. We're going to start by asking each of our panelists to tell us about how and when they came to the United States. Let's start with Isabel. Uh, good evening, everyone. My parents brought me here when I was six years old. Very courageous individuals. They left their home country. They left everything to provide a better future for my siblings and for myself. So I was six years old when they brought me here and started the first grade here in the public school system. Thank you. Jonathan? I came here back in January 2004 when I was 14 years old. I actually found that I was coming um, 16 hours before I got in the plane. I really had no idea. Um, we had a very hard life in Peru. We didn't have any jobs. Or my parents did not have any jobs, so they decided to move here in the hope that me and my sister would have a better future. Thank you. Cessna? Sir, um, my parents and I came to the United States whenever I was three years old. We moved directly to Bentonville, Arkansas, and um, I've lived there ever since. You speak English with an Arkansas accent. Do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Carlos? Yes. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. My name is Carlos Saavedra. Um, I came here when I was 12 years old uh, with my parents from Lima, Peru. I am no longer undocumented, but I came with the promise that I was going to get to see Mickey Mouse in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Cesar? Thank you. Just wanted to say what a beautiful state. I'm from New York City, so beautiful green state. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I share a similar story. My, actually, my father passed away when I was uh, four years old, and, you know, I never met my father. And after that, it was, you know, definitely very difficult for my mother. So at five years old, she, you know, made a very courageous decision to make sure that you know, me and my younger brother had a good life. So I've been back in New York, Brooklyn, New York, and I, you know, I've been here ever since, and this is my home. Thank you. Rosa. My parents uh, were actually not with me. My mother was with me. My brother was also with me. We were told we were going to Disney World. Um, she has yet to take me also. Um, <laughs> I was five years old. Uh, I do remember that the first day of class was right after we had arrived into Queen, Arkansas has been my home since. Thank you all. Let me pose this question to you for any of you that would like to answer it. When did you first learn that you were not American citizen and when did you first understand what undocumented means? Chancellor, I'd like to yes. take us. Actually, the, one of the first time it was actually after 9-11. Um, it was just I got it right after high school and, mm -hmm. and my first thing, my first reaction was, you know, I need to, I went to the Marine enlistment office in, in Brooklyn. I knew I had a, I knew the call of duty, you know, for, for my country. And it was there that basically, well, well you know, just provide us your document, the, you know, your social security. I was like, well, I don't have it. I just, you know, I want to come here and make sure that I want to come here to fight for my country. And it was at that moment, really, that, that struck that, you know, I, I wasn't like my friends. Thank you. Any of our other panelists? Yes, um, Jonathan. Uh, the moment when it really hit me that I was an undocumented student was when I was a senior in high school and I wanted to apply for scholarships. I um, had a great GPA. I was overcommitted in multiple things. Um, 
and many of the applications requested you to be or asked you to be a, either a U.S. citizen or resident, and basically that lowered my chances of getting a scholarship to five to seven percent. Um, so it was a very frustrating uh, moment in time when and I finally realized I am an, an, I, I am a undocumented student, and I'm limited. Um, Thank you. Many of you in the audience probably know that Jonathan has a beautiful operatic voice. He has studied voice here at the university, and I asked him earlier today if he would like to sing his answers. And uh, I think he thought I was serious there for a second. Let me ask, um, how did your status affect your social life in high school? Were you afraid to tell your friends? Uh, did it affect the way that you were treated? Anyone? I, I can talk about that just Cessna? a little bit. Um, yes, sir. It was um, a little bit difficult. It's a little bit difficult um, being able to go out and do the things that you know everyone else did. Going out at 16, trying to drive, trying to go out, um, traveling uh, on plane. That was never an option. Um, I, I never told any of my friends. Um, it wasn't until um, I think it was like my second year of college that I told maybe two or three um, and that was because I I needed to tell someone um, but it, it was definitely um, an anchor in um, in my limitations as to what I could and couldn't do socially so yes yeah. thank you others all right let's move on to another question what kind of reaction have you experienced from other Latinos who do have legal status uh, that were born uh, elsewhere, but um, perhaps they uh, were able to uh, become documented, or perhaps they were actually born here. I'd like to answer that, Chancellor. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us come from mixed status families. We have had a lot of support from our, uh, what we like to call documented dreamers or allies. So we've had a lot of support. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, sir. Uh, many of our classmates, people we went to school in law school, you know, pe you know, our friends who we played in the playground. I think many people didn't understand the issue, just like many Americans don't understand the issue. But it's when you know they see their their you know their friend, their best friend, their classmates. And that was like actually that got response from. They react, you know, this is this is my issue as well. You're obviously all very bright individuals. How has being undocumented affected your personal aspirations? I will actually just begin like with a little story on that. Um, last year was the, one of the happiest uncertain moments of my life, which was my law school graduation. You know, I saw myself walking up the stage receiving my, my diploma. But unlike many of my friends you know, who were ready to go into the world and you know, become lawyers and be there for for their family, for, that was a not, that, I didn't see that for myself. And you know, even though I had have, I have received many opportunities, for me it was an uncertain, and you know, a lot of my goals had, had to be dashed because of that, I had to find other ways. So that's how it's affected me. Others, how, how has it affected your aspirations? Um, Jonathan? It makes me try harder. I, it makes me not wanna, not wanna quit, even though like, we are limited in many different areas. Um, for example, I was offered uh, to be able to go to Austria a couple of weeks ago, all paid for to go to a summer opera school, and I couldn't take it because I cannot travel outside the U.S. However, like, I know that even though doors may close, like, some windows are gonna open up, um, and it makes me try even harder, and it makes me not wanna quit, and it makes me want to inspire other people to do the same things. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd like to share a story. Rosa? Um, in 2004, my family went to, through a very traumatic event. Um, I gave up. I didn't want to go to school. Um, I was offered scholarships, but I couldn't take them. So I gave up. For six years, I did not attend college. Um, last year, I met some awesome dreamers who helped me get that confidence back. I started school, and I am, I'm going to finish my master's. So. Excellent. Good for you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's panel, as you 
uh, know consists entirely of Latinos, but that wasn't by choice. I want you to know that we did approach uh, several people of various ethnic backgrounds to participate, but they were understandably concerned about the exposure. Let me ask our panelists, why did you agree to take part in tonight's program, and are you worried about your own personal exposure? I guess I'd have to say that I'm undocumented and no longer afraid. And I feel that the more open we are about our status, the safer we are. And I always like to use the example of, say, Juan and Maria, and they're both undocumented. And Maria's very open about her status, and she volunteers, and she's a great leader, and she's just an amazing person overall. And Juan is very reserved about his status and ashamed, and he doesn't want anyone to know about him. And if both of them are put in deportation proceedings, most people are going to say, well, wait, we know Maria. We don't, we don't want her to be sent back to her country, right, to wherever she's from, uh, even though she's grown up here all her life. And she's going to have this great support. But if we say, can you help Juan, most people are going to say, well, who's Juan? I don't know him, right? And I think that we always hear these, is these issues and illegals this and illegals that, which, by the way, I really dislike that term because I don't think any human being is illegal. We are undocumented. We are undocumented because we lack a piece of paper. But other than that, we're real human beings who have dreams and aspirations, who have grown up in the United States, and this is all we know as home. And so putting a face to such a controversial issue, I think that really helps to change minds and hearts. Thank you, Isabel. Others? And to follow that is, you know, the, the risk of real. You know, we, I'm sure many of us have received when we actually came public, you know, we receive hate mails, death threats, you know, we, it, they're very real. The, the threat of actually being deported is real. But it's because, you know, if, if we cannot fight for ourselves, mm. you know, who else is going to be in the front lines with us? And, you know, we have seen that it's, it's, it's through really through, there's people, the way I see it, there's people who, do things, and there's people who watch people do other do things. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be on on the side of the people who does things, just like many in this room. Thank you. Anyone else? The truth sets you free, <laughs> so I'm documented and unafraid. Let's uh, switch now and talk just a little bit about the Dream Act. I'd like to see if Carlos might uh, share a short explanation of the Dream Act perhaps for those uh, in the room that aren't familiar with it. Carlos, would you like to talk a little bit about it? Yes, thank you, Chancellor. Uh, so the DREAM Act is pretty much a piece of legislation in Congress that will bring uh, a conditional status for undocumented youth across the country. It has five key requirements. The first one is that you must have entered the country before the age of 15. The second one is that you have lived in the country for at least five years, so five years of residing that you have lived in this country. Three, that you have graduated from high school or have gotten a GED or something equivalent towards that. Uh, fourth, that you have good moral character, meaning that you haven't been convicted of any serious felony. And fifth, uh, that you either attend college or, the or serve in the military for a period of two years. Thank you. And is it true that the passage of the DREAM Act won't necessarily mean that students get in-state tuition. Is that a correct statement? Yes, that's a correct statement. So there really has to be further legislation or no legislation to prevent it uh, in order to allow undocumented students, even if the DREAM Act passes, to uh, be able to go to college uh, and pay in-state tuition. That's right, and that's why you know, many of us here are working in our current state. I'm from Massachusetts. And we're working very diligently to pass laws locally that allow undocumented students to access higher education, to access in-state tuition, to access many other benefits that students need to graduate and fulfill their dreams. And we know that even when DREAM Act passes, <coughs> which we know will be soon, that we still have to advocate in our local states for these yeah. policies. And just so everybody knows that here at the University of Arkansas, in-state tuition is about $7,100. In, out of state tuition is $17,000. So that differential makes it very, very difficult to access higher education. 
Carlos, tell us, um, what is the status in Congress right now of the DREAM Act? Can you give us a little more information about that? And yes, and, I can, and I'll share the mic again with some of my We all live and breathe the DREAM Act every day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, well, the DREAM Act, got, we had a Senate vote in 2010. We were not able uh, to pass the Senate. We missed by five votes, both five Republican members that we thought we could get their support and five Democratic members that we couldn't get their support. They did not show. Uh, but recently, the DREAM Act has been reintroduced. It was reintroduced last year, more than anything symbolically, because there is a big obstruction going on in, you know, both in the Senate and especially in the House of Representatives that hasn't been allowed, that hasn't allowed it to move. Uh, but I think I would love folks to add for this as well. But I think everybody knows across the country that the DREAM Act has, you know, really risen to be one of the top issues in the country, the issues that every candidate that is holding office, either if it's in Texas or that wants to hold office in Arizona, anywhere across the country talking about this issue, even though this issue cannot move right now. And in addition, um, now there's some, there's some discussions about proposal by Senator Marco Rubio from Florida proposing a piece of legislation similar to the DREAM Act, and, but in this piece of legislation, it would, inc would not include a path to citizenship but leave it alternative ways to obtain that citizenship. So at this moment, there's still discussions between the parties and, you know, as undocumented youth, one of the things that we say, you know, we're definitely, we're not advocating for any party. We're advocating for our communities. We're advocating for our families and our country. So we invite discussions between parties and we, you know, I think bipartisanship is something that this country badly needs. Any other panelists want to say anything about the DREAM Act? I'd like to add, we hear sometimes people saying, well, the Dream, the Dream Act is amnesty, right? But the way that the, the current version of the Dream Act is written is that if you go to college or you serve in the military, you then have to wait under conditional legal status for 10 years. And once those 10 years go by, you can then get a green card. And once you have a green card, then you have to be a green card holder for at least five years before you can even apply to become a U.S. citizen. So under the DREAM Act, we're talking about a 15 to 20 year process for anyone to become a U.S. citizen. Um, but I think, as Cesar said, you know, we would just be happy with the work permit to, to be able to stay here legally and work legally and not be scared every day that we could be deported and separated from our families and be sent back to a country we hardly remember because the U.S. is our home. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. One of the arguments that we have heard over and over um, is that the DREAM Act will cost taxpayers money, and it will also take spots in universities and colleges away from those legally in the United States. Anybody want to respond to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, tackle, I'll tackle that you know, right off the bat. Um, the DREAM Act was actually, you know, it was budgeted to, to see how much it would cost the taxpayers, if any. And what they found, the, the number of people, is that the DREAM Act would reduce the deficit of, of over $1.4 billion over 10 years. It will increase $2.3 billion of revenue. That's just simply like in your little neighborhood. There's 10, there's 10 houses. There's, you know, overall you have $100,000 debt. Wouldn't you want, you know, every member contributing into that, into making sure that you thrive your community? By, by passing this bill, it's, you're adding billions of dollars to contribute to the economy. You're reducing our debt. And, you know, who, who doesn't like a couple, you know, billion dollars? So I'm sure, so. Yes, no, I, I thought it was about the billion dollars. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, I disagree that people take the, the spots of citizens. I have a friend who is a nurse and he worked so hard to get into nursing school and he paid his way to nursing school. He didn't take the spot of anyone, he earned it. So we're not taking anybody's position, we are earning it. A related point to this is that some will argue that providing financial aid and in-state tuition to uh, undocumented students will overburden the taxpayers. Similar but a little different issue. Anybody have any views about that? I'll, I'll answer that. <laughs> um, I believe that um, 
a lot of the students in Arkansas graduate and then start start working. Um, I do believe that if the DREAM Act is passed, uh, our students will graduate with uh, the opportunity to go to college. I do believe that that will create a financial uh, gain to the institutions, especially here in Arkansas. One point that I think we need to make, and you folks can make it uh, more eloquently than I can, is the fact that many years ago, 20-something years ago, the Supreme Court issued a ruling, Supreme Court of the United States, that uh, undocumented students at the primary and secondary school level have an absolute right to go to school. Unfortunately, that did not extend on to going to, uh, uh, to higher education, but any comments about that, that, that you have an absolute right by the Supreme Court ruling to go to school, it's just that that stops when you want to go to college. Well, Does that seem sort of like counterintuitive? I would like to comment on that, Chancellor. Um, I just, I do want to um, let everyone know that um, the money that everyone puts into our education whenever we're going through kindergarten through uh, you know, senior year, that money is being lost if we are not allowed to continue our education. We are your investment. All of us pay taxes, no one is saved from that. And all of the money that goes into our public schools is being wasted whenever we are not allowed to continue on with our education. We are losing an investment, essentially. Thank you. Every indication is that migration to and from Mexico has been at historic lows for the last few years, resulting actually in a net loss of immigrants. Can anybody explain this to our audience? Uh, and what effect does it have on the DREAM movement? The fact that migration to and from Mexico has been quite low for the last few years. Anybody want to take that one on? I can answer that. Um, in 1989, whenever we came to the United States, the economy in uh, Mexico was very bad, and that is why my parents decided to, to come to the United States. Uh, the economic growth in Mexico has risen in the past few years, and uh, we have seen that the economy in the U.S. has uh, potentially suffered. Uh, the point that I think we're trying to make is that many people that are opposed to the DREAM Act mm. will say that... Um, these people are teeming across the borders and we've got to stop it. When in fact, we're dealing with people that have been in this country for many years um, that came here through no volition of their own and the whole thought that people are still teeming across the borders has been reduced substantially. And I think that's a very important point to make. And one another key point is you, you hear the buzzwords, you know, border security, you know, the border's out of control, but does anyone know the safest cities in the U.S.? They're actually El Paso, El Paso and San Diego. Thank you. One of the most closest cities next to, they're literally kissing the border. And those are the safest cities in our, in our country. That goes to show you how the border is, is, is not the issue, but the overall system and how it, it affects, in terms of how it affects this DREAM Act, I think it's just arguments against the DREAM Act, you know, safety, economics, it's, you know, the time is right for the DREAM Act. What are the actual requirements to gain American citizenship? Let's give our audience a little sense. We've touched on it a little bit, but what do you have to do right now without the DREAM Act to gain citizenship? Anybody want to tackle that one? Well, the reality is that for most of us, there's no line for us to get in. There's just absolutely no line. My, um, my stepfather is a U.S. citizen, and he applied for me in 2004. But our immigration is so complex, it's, it's so broken that it all depends where you came from, what country you're from, how you entered, but especially for Mexicans, it's very difficult. And right now they're reviewing applications from 1993. There's a priority date. And my petition's 2004, so I mean, I might be dead by the time they get to my application, <laughs> to be honest with you. And so, like I said, there's no line. And even if I were to marry a US citizen, that means I would have to leave the country and, and get a 10 year bar, a risk that I don't want to take, just having to think that I'm going to be away for 10 years from all I know. And so the DREAM Act would create that line. It would give us, it would create that pathway 
for citizenship. And the same applies to me. Like when I was detained in Florida, my mom um, applied for my residential status. And that was a year and three months ago or so, and we still have no answer. Like we, don't know, we do not know if it has been rejected or if it has been accepted, which is still pending. We still have no idea what's going to happen to me or if it will ever get to me. I may never know if I'm going to be able to be legal in the U.S. If you were suddenly deported, tell me what it would be like to go back to your country of birth. What would be there for you, if anything? Well, for me, like, um, I, mean, I, I love Fayetteville. Fayetteville is my home, and to think about going back is extremely difficult for me, especially, like, even career-wise, I want to be an opera singer, and there's no way I can make that happen in South America. Um, they don't have schools for that, and if they do, it's very limited. Um, it's just weird. It's, it's weird to think about leaving your home and the people that you love. I mean, my family is in Fable. My, my closest friends, this is a place where I grew up and where my morals got established. It's just, it's almost like it will be going to a completely different world um, for me. Yes, also, um, I'm right now, I'm studying broadcast journalism. That is my major. Um, to go back to Mexico would be extremely dangerous. Um, for, for any, any of us right, right now if we were deported, but as a, a journalist in general, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a dangerous job right now. Um, so if I were to be report, uh, deported to Mexico, I don't, I don't have much family there um, that I know personally. Um, I, I don't know the way of life that, you know, people have over there. I don't understand a lot of uh, the legalities that would include having to get a, a driver's license, having to uh, get anything uh, to be able to live there. So it just, it, it wouldn't be logical to move willingly over there because I just, I don't know the system. I don't know how things work. Anyone else? And I guess similar, it's, you know, I think something that has been echo, it's, you know, for myself, you know, you know, New York is my home. You know, I grew up watching the Yankees. I grew up, you know, disliking the Red, Boston Red Sox. <laughs> um, no offense. You know, I grew up, you know, you know the, the streets, the, my neighborhood, that's, that's, that's who I am. That's, this, that's me. It's like, it's like someone ripping you out of your family and never seeing them again. That's, that's, what, that's what the real feeling is. That's what the real you know, experience is. Getting ripped out of your home that you have, that you have cultivated memories to all throughout your life. What would you have if you were forced to go back? What would be there for you? Nothing. My, all my family's here. My, 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 you know, in addition to my, my family, it's just my aspirations. You know, it's here, it's, it's who I am, you know, I'm an American. Regardless of what everyone tells me, the way I feel, you know, I'm broken, born and raised. And that's, that's what I always will feel. Uh, let me mention to the audience that over the past um, couple of weeks, we have asked people to submit questions for the panel through email, through Facebook and Twitter. Uh, we've also contacted some of the organizations that are frankly, publicly opposed to the DREAM Act, and we've asked them to submit questions. And tonight, uh, each attendee was offered the uh, ability to submit a question, and Dr. Bill Schwab has gathered those and selected several for the panel to address. Let me start with some that we've received over the past couple of weeks. This question comes from Stephen Skatebow of Fayetteville. He would like a panelist to explain the ways an immigrant can get a visa and whether the process is harder on those would-be immigrants who are poor. Well, I know I, my parents came here for a better economic opportunity. And really, to get a visa, you have to prove that you own all this property and you have all this money in the bank and you're really rich, right? And my family's not wealthy, and so there was just no way for them to get a visa. 
Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add yeah. to that. Or you, you can have, if you have, it used to be a million dollars. If you have a million dollars, you can get a visa. I don't know <laughs> if anyone in this room has a million dollars, but my family does not. So that's a way to, to get it. Also, well, that's sort of the American way. You can get an honorary degree with a million dollars. Not really. I didn't. That's, that's not really true. Uh, that's a joke. Don't, don't print that. Anyone else? Um, also, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but... Um, I mean, I'm an undocumented student. I can go back to Peru like, um, by voluntary deportation, and I can reapply for a visa to come here. However, once I put one step in Peru, I have a 10-year penalty for being staying here undocumented. Um, there is a waiver that you can pay for, but you may not get it. And once I reapply for the visa, um, there's a possibility um, that I may not get it because I stay here illegally. So there's almost like, no just, yeah, there's no chance. Um, Okay. And I would also maybe add um, that I have a younger brother. We came in together when I was 12. He's four years old. He's about to graduate high school in Boston, Massachusetts in just a couple of months, in two or three months. And I, got, I have the privilege of having my documents now. And a couple of years ago, I wanted to petition for him. And uh, he was around 14. Um, and, and I couldn't petition for him because from brother to brother, there's a 12 to 15 year wait. And the catch-22 is that he has to be under 21 when he receives the visa. So because he aged out, I mean, we didn't, he didn't have 15, 12 years, he's not able to do it. So literally, we, you know, I love my brother. You know, we, we've done everything together, and I cannot see him leave this country. Jonathan, you've got an interesting situation in that, am I correct, both of your parents are... American citizens? Is that uh, accurate? They're residents. They will, residents. Be, they will be citizens in, in six to eight months. Mm. But somehow you are in that proverbial catch-22. You want to comment? Uh, are you comfortable commenting about what happened? Uh, you mean in Florida? They want to, yes. Yeah. Well, I was detained um, in Florida for a period of four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, my parents, um, my mom applied for me to become a U.S. resident. And, by, and on November the 7th of this past year, I was granted prosecutorial discretion, meaning that I could stay here legally and I could get a work authorization. However, even though I'm entitled to one, I am not getting one still. Like, they keep rejecting my application. Or it's, we have applied like four different times, and every time they keep sending back the application, we have no idea why, uh, because technically we're allowed to. I mean, I'm allowed to get a work permit, but it's just not happening. And you went uh, on vacation? I did. <laughs> a very Florida. extended it, Christmas break. It wasn't break. a very good vacation, I understand. <laughs> yeah. You wanna, <laughs> yeah. Are I, you comfortable talking about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I had um, one of the worst, but yet one of the best experiences of my life in Florida. I was, I, there was this huge family crisis, and I went to Florida to see my mom. While I, I got to the Greyhound bus, I got off the bus, in Fort Lauderdale, and as soon as I came off the bus, I was the only Hispanic out of, ten, out of a group of 10 people, and a border patrol officer stopped me and asked me for documents, which I did not have. Um, so they detained me for a period of four weeks, in which um, it was, uh, I mean, a very hard experience, but it was also a great experience for me. I was able to translate different Bible studies, and I had the best time talking about Jesus and God, and I just loved it. Uh, so, um, but it was, it was a very difficult time for me, knowing that I could be deported at any point. I mean, the judge was completely against me, and yet, like, I was able to get out thanks to the support of friends and the University of Arkansas and my family, but I... This is going to sound really weird, but I love my experience there. Like, I <laughs> met so many people, but I also realized how unjust it is. I met a guy from, that came here when he was two months old. He doesn't speak any Spanish. His family is from Mexico. Uh, he has one kid who was born uh, in the U.S., has a fiancé who's a U.S. citizen, and he was about to be deported. Um, so it's, and, I, and that was one of like many, many cases. There were people that were brought to the detention center, like 30 people a day, 
and 50 people that same day will leave. It was a daily thing of people coming, getting detained, and people getting deported daily. Uh, so I was, it's funny, like we talk about immigration and we know the laws and we kind of, kind of understand it, but it's not until you put a face to it that you really understand what it really means and the things that we have to go through and the things that many people like us have to go through. Thank you, Jonathan. I have a, uh, I think, what is a very important question that we need to answer because I think there's a lot of ignorance, frankly, out there. And I have received this week and last week, uh, in anticipation of tonight, a number of emails and inquiries that really don't understand the, the, uh, the nature of this, of this problem and what it means. And let me, let me read this question. Um, this comes from uh, Jan Lee of the Secure Arkansas Organization. Um, was quoted as saying that her group is upset that undocumented immigrants receive government aid. She was quoted as saying that undocumented immigrants are, and I quote, demanding benefits that American citizens are not getting, end quote. Now let's clear things up for our audience. What benefits are you getting that American citizens don't get? <laughs> I'm not we getting any benefits. I'm not getting any Are there any? The reality is that undocumented immigrants do not qualify for government aid. You have to have a social security number for that. And so undocumented immigrants don't qualify for any of that. In fact, immigrants pay taxes. We pay, last year we paid $11.2 billion in taxes while GE paid nothing. Um, well, not in 2010, I'm sorry. And <laughs> We pay $8.4 billion in sales taxes because it's not like I can go to Walmart and say, I'm undocumented, don't charge me sales taxes. <laughs> I have to pay my sales taxes, right? <laughs> 106 point, uh, $1.6 billion in property taxes. We have to, I own a car and I pay my property taxes and $1.2 in income taxes. And not to mention that undocumented immigrants pay into Social Security number, and so there's a huge fund of, of money that's been paid into the Social Security by undocumented immigrants that they will never be able to claim. Let me ask you, uh, what about welfare? Uh, you don't qualify we, for we welfare, don't. so we don't. there are no payments of welfare to undocumented people. No. What about Pell Grants? No payment of Pell Grants to undocumented people. What about uh, health care costs? No benefits there. Are there any benefits that you can think of? In other words, is it correct to say that undocumented students are not taking benefits away from American citizens? Is that accurate in your minds? Absolutely. You know, for myself, you know, when people say, well, how, can, how did you afford going to law school? You know, of course, one of the greatest support was many of my support system. My dean actually, you know, helped me sufficient. But the other was actually me working. Me, I, you know, I actually had to find ways. So I started selling books. I started, you know, tutoring. I started finding ways to really, you know, come up with the money myself. And, and even including this year, this year, actually, you know, after law school, I was like, you know, what's next? You know what? What's the what's the next best thing that you know a lot of Americans are really good at? Being entrepreneurs. I actually started my own uh, campaign, political consulting firm, and we, I've been uh, for my my first year paying taxes. Though I've been paying taxes, you know, for the past for the past years, and you know, I know you know from here how many of us have paid taxes? Raise your hands. We all pay taxes. You know, and you know, we are we are given into a system that you know. For me, I don't mind paying for a system that has helped me so, so much. That is my contribution. You know, Social Security, we're contributing to Social Security. You know, I, it's, my, so it's my time to work. You know, so, so many, many before us who've worked, it's my time to give back. Yes. I would just like to add another fact. Mm -hmm. A lot of undocumented immigrants are issued an ITIN number, an individual taxpayer identification number by the IRS. So they know who we are, they, and they give us this number so we can pay our taxes, but they don't want us to work here legally. And it just, it's mind-boggling. It doesn't make sense, right? And we all know that um, an educated person, someone with a college degree, earns uh, up to a million dollars more than anyone who doesn't. 
And so we, we, they have already invested in our education K through 12. Some of us have college degrees. Why not give us the opportunity to work and contribute and pay more taxes? Isabel. <laughs> <laughs> we don't mind. This is our home. We want to contribute and give back to, to our home country. Too. I think that's a very important point. And as a matter of fact, I was not knowledgeable about the ITN number, oh, yes. uh, which is, of course, different than a Social Security number. Yes. And I asked Dr. Schwab recently, I said, well, explain to me why the government would give an ITN number so that the person can pay taxes, but they could be deported. And mm. Bill's reply was, well, our government likes collecting taxes from anybody, but not giving citizenship. So right. <laughs> I guess that's the issue. I don't know. Um, Actually, Chance, I, you know, yes. I also wanted to, to bring about, you know, in terms of a... You know, there's been, you know, this, you know, very talked about, you know, let's just deport them all. But it would cost over $285 billion just to, just to even identify people, let alone actually doing the actual work. So it's like, it's economically, it's like, you know, would you want to give your house just for the sake of, you know, killing a, a cockroach? You know, so it's, you know, it's, it's economically, you know, well, I'm from New York, so there are plenty of there. Already, so. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's mind-boggling. Let me take this another step. Uh, the other question that are on, are on a lot of people's minds that you hear about is that you as undocumented people are taking jobs away from U.S. citizens, that because you're here, American citizens are not able to get jobs in certain areas. Any comments on that? I actually just want to recount the story of actually my, of my buddy from Arizona. He graduated, law, he graduated uh, from the Arizona State University, and he was like, you know what, uh, I need to, I need to you know, work. So what he did is actually he started his own computer business, mm -hmm. and you know, for over the, I think two months ago, he hired the first U.S. citizen of his, of his, of his, of his business. So, and that's just a very modest example, the potential we can do. You know, so that's really goes to show you like how we can contribute. So you know, we're not stealing. We're create. We can create even more jobs. Mm -hmm. What about? Uh, does anybody want to comment on what happened? I believe in. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was in um, Alabama yes. recently. Uh, are you f uh, familiar with what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, tell our audience about the issues there and what's happened with the farm. Uh, yeah. crops. Uh, I think it's something that our audience needs to know. Yeah. Well, I, actually, I was in Alabama last year, uh, right before when they were about to pass the extreme anti-immigrant law uh, in the state. But after they passed the law in the state, uh, the interesting thing, and, 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 I, and I think it's, it's good for us to say that the immigrant labor that comes into the country uh, can, and most likely cannot get replaced. And that's what happened in Alabama is a perfect example of that. Uh, many of the farm workers that they needed to pick up uh, some of the tomatoes and some of the products uh, that they farmed there in Alabama, nobody could, could pick them up. Uh, I know that there was a lot of conversations, a lot of media around some of the farm owners uh, that, you know, they were saying, well, we brought some American workers, but they were not in the expertise, so they did not want to do this kind of job. Because the reality is, and all of us know, is that immigrants do some of the most menial jobs, some of the most dangerous jobs, some of the jobs a lot of people don't want to do, you know? And I think something that here we don't speak about, it's uh, the many businesses or corporations um, that are gaining so much money on the backs of immigrants, but and also immigrants, but the backs of all American workers. My father is a janitor, my mother is a nanny, you know? They pay taxes, but they don't make that much money, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think instead of us having a conversation about how does the immigrant that come and pick up our tomato uh, and how do we put the person through jail and how do we put the person to trauma and how do we not pay them and how do we do all these things? How about we don't talk about putting their kids to college? Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm thinking and I think all of us here are thinking about what's going to be the investment of our country? What's going to be of this United States of America? That's the question that I'm trying to solve for my brother. Uh, it's not just about immigration. What's going to happen? What's going to happen with these thousands of professionals that the country needs? Here's a question that um, uh, we've already sort of touched on, but I want to read it. It's from uh, Mr. Richard Sackett from Cherokee Village, Arkansas, and he writes, and I quote, Why don't you just simply get on track to become a citizen 
or at least gain legal status by applying for legal immigration status. You're <laughs> illegal in this country. Why don't you try to become legal? Now, we've already touched on this, but that puts it in a little more of a context. Anybody want to touch on that again? I mean, we're really trying. It's not like, <laughs> I mean, it's not like we're not doing anything about it, but I mean, the system is just completely broken. There's nothing that we cannot do. I mean, like your case, my case, we are waiting and we get no answers. I mean, not even a lead to where to go or who to ask for help. Um, I mean, we really want to be U.S. citizens and live here in this place that we consider our home, but there's nothing we can do about it. It's really frustrating um, for all of us. And if uh, the, the person asking the question would like to direct us to where the line is, mm -hmm. I would <laughs> love to go get in that line. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, myself, uh, I remember like, you know, that's before going to law school and Actually, like I think my freshman year of, of college, I was like, hey, you know what? Maybe, you know, maybe there's something. I actually went to the uh, U.S. Immigration <laughs> Office. I, I got in there, and all of a sudden, they were, you know, they're like, you know, I was like, hey, you know, I wanna, I wanna know how to apply. I'm like, so, you know, how are you? Like, well, you know, I just, I was here. You know, I came little. You know, when I was little, I have no, no stat. He was like, you should even be in this building. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, he goes, I would recommend you, like, you know, just leave quietly, <laughs> but you know, just don't come back. I was like, all right, well, I'll come back soon, though. But, um, <laughs> Very good. And actually, Chancellor, I'd like to share a little story. Um, Please. And, uh, we qualified for the, leg for the Reagan legalization, and uh, my parents uh, filled out the paperwork, and because they're so far behind, our papers were reviewed in 2004. Mm -hmm. We uh, had green cards. I had a green card in my hand. Um, but because of the broken in immigration system, and for reasons that I have no idea what they are, um, our documents were taken away. So I'm stuck in the middle. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Anyone else on this issue? All right, um, let me move on. This question comes from a Mr. Jim Gilchrist of Laguna Hills, California. Mr. Gilchrist is the president of the National Minuteman Project. And uh, he writes, and I quote, if those individuals not legally residing in the United States are given legal residency or citizenship, wouldn't that send a message to our society and future generations that the rule of law only applies to those who are willing to respect the rule of law, end quote. Anybody want to take that one on? No, I, I think, you know, you know, we've been here. We've been here all our lives, you know, since we were little, and we we have we have followed everything that has required of a country. You know, you're you're told to you know, go to school. You're told to stay out of trouble. You know, you're told to work. You're told to commit yourself to your family, to your country. I have done all those things. After 9/11, that was my my only thought was, Caesar, you need to go into the Marines. You need to be there for your country. It was my only thought. And since then, even now, I'm, you know, I have, I have done everything that's required of me. Everything. And I'm willing to do more. You know, me, you know I came when I was five years old. You know, this is, this is you know, all I knew was that I was, I was going to be in a better, better place to really be free, where I can, you know, play in the playgrounds. That's, you know, that is, that is what... The whole principle, you know, just forget about one law. It's about the principle of our country, the roots. You know, that's who we are as Americans. Thank you. Here's a question from William Gein of Raleigh, North Carolina. He's the president of Americans for Legal Immigration. He wants to know whether you agree or disagree that your college enrollment denied someone else, such as an American citizen or a legal immigrant, a seat in a college that you attend or might attend. They should have tried harder. I, got a four point, I had a 4.0 GPA in high school. I graduated from college magna cum laude honors, and we work hard and we earn it. It's not like we're giving this seat, you know, quote, unquote. We had to work hard for it. 
And I do want to add something else. How would you not want your your children to be educated? Is there a cap off to uh, to our universities? There is none. We want to get our students educated. We want to have a educated um, work front. So why would you not want your students to continue on with their education? There is no cap off uh, for our colleges. So if you really wanted to think about it, I agree, you would have to work harder for that position and that's what we all did. We worked really hard, we got good grades and that's why we are where we are because we worked hard. And Following on that, you know, actually, after graduating law school, you have to take the, the miserable bar, and I, I it, it was not fun. It was literally being in a desk from 9 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock midnight, cramming law literally every second, and it's not fun. It's like, it's, but I did it, because I did it because I, you know, I, I put myself into that, you know, I, I worked hard. No one took the bar exam for me. No one, you know, woke up at five o'clock in the morning for me. No one, you know, took. No one traveled six hours of commute just to get to school for me. Mm. It was me. You know, I woke up at four o'clock in the morning, came home at like one o'clock at night, got up again and went to school. You know, no one did that for me, and 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 that's that's the simply that it's just like you know we earned it. You know, and even the Dream Act. The Dream Act is that. We're not asking for any handouts. All we, all we want is simply an opportunity. That's all we're asking for. Cesar, I didn't like law school either, I must say to you. <laughs> and um, and uh, I, so I can sort of uh, understand what you're saying. And you didn't even have Al Whitty in class. So that's sort of an inside joke. Sorry, Dean, but, but I understand what you're saying. This is a question um, from uh, a gentleman uh, at Arkansas Tech University in Russellville. Mm -hmm. How do undocumented students manage to finance their college education without FAFSA aid or other types of aid? Do you want to, any of you want to comment on, on how you did it, those of you that have been able to do it? Um, Jonathan? The way I, I, I knocked on every single door there was and I tried to get as many scholarships as I possibly could, I did get a artistic excellent excellence award um, through the music department that paid for part of my tuition and then I got a bunch of um, private scholarships that allowed me to pay for the rest um, along with other people I've been really blessed and speak to God with people that believe in me and believe in my dreams uh, and so potential in me that supported me and helped me pay for my education um, that's how I did it out of pocket um because my parents believed that education was something that was very important. Um, they, they helped fund um, my education and they're still helping me fund my education. I, I'm working, I um, am babysitting, I'm doing one thing or another trying to, trying to get some money to, to be able to pay for my tuition, but my parents are also paying out of pocket. We do get, um, private scholarships that are available to us, but because tuition is so high, um, it's, it's takes a lot longer to pay for, um, for your classes. But if you really want it, you find a way to pay for it. Mm. So it's, it's not a handout, as a lot of people have, have mentioned. If you really, really want your education, you're gonna find a way to fund it. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer because you work a semester, you go to school a semester, you work a semester, you go to school. It'll take you twice as, as long, but like Cessna said, if you want it, you're going to fight for it and you're going to get it. And also, like for myself, like in college, I had to work. I had to, you know, go to work. I, had, I, was, tu I was tutoring in philosophy. I was, I was, you know, helping students with their philosophy papers, you know, although some of them offer a lot more money to do their paper rather than help them do their paper. <laughs> but, uh, but it was, you know, it was through myself. In, in law school, uh, sometimes they didn't even buy books. I had to be in the library. And when I did buy books, I had to resell them right away to make sure that uh, I had the money for there. And it's just simply, you know, it was, it was, it was through us. You know, I, for me in college, I wish I would have been, I was still involved in you know, my committee, but, you know, I wish I would have been in, in a team. I wish I would have been, in, you know, involved in, in clubs. I didn't have the luxury. I had to school, work, 
school work and you know that's it's you know but that's that's okay you know that's okay you know we're not saying you know hey you know I would, I'm, I'm proud with what I've done but you know I you know just to kind of say that it's no handout we didn't get anything from government didn't come and say here here's a million dollars go go for you you know we earned it each of you are obviously enterprising and you set your sights you wanted to get an education comment for us about those that were perhaps classmates in high school that didn't have the same opportunity. In other words, those that didn't have the funds, perhaps they weren't motivated the same way or they didn't uh, have parents that were as motivated. Tell me and tell our audience, what has happened to some of them? Can you give me some thoughts on your friends that maybe did not go on or could not access education? They settled, you know, they I had many friends who just like me and just like many of us like had, had dreams and had aspirations that wanted to be or study business management or study architecture and because they were undocumented and they saw all these doors being closed, they quit and they settled with construction or painting or working at a chicken factory or, or going back to their countries. You know, it's, it's the saddest thing to see um, dreams being shattered and completely destroyed uh, because of the lack of resources and the lack of support. Um, just lives being destroyed daily um, with disappointments and mm. frustrations. Yes, um, you can, whenever you talk to, to classmates that, that weren't as fortunate as, as, we, as we are, um, you, you see them, Talking about their their daily life and like a light in them has 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 diminished mm. because of that lost hope, um, and I I do agree with what Jonathan says that they um, they settle but they settle because they've lost hope, mm -hmm. and we we can't allow that to happen. These are people that we as a society have funded their education, our education, as I mentioned earlier through our taxes. And seeing someone lose hope is the worst thing that we can ever experience and see firsthand. And I think also in terms of like, you know, it's when you're, when you're 25, 26, 22 in college, you know, yes, you know, it's, it's very difficult. But, you know, imagine when you're 16 mm -hmm. and you lose hope. And, you know, actually one of a, you know, one of a very tragic stories actually in Texas, so, a high school who, who was a very talented architect actually designed their home in Texas. You know, very small, very modest, but he saw no hope, and he actually, he actually committed suicide because, you know, you know, there, he, like, you know, like uh, Jonathan was saying, his, his dreams were shattered, you know, and he saw no way out. And, you know, that's, you know, that's, you know not only dreams, but talent that was lost. I have to acknowledge my privilege of having... Uh, an education, right? And so many young people who, who lose hope. But through the passage of the DREAM Act, we can give them hope. Mm -hmm. We can say, look, um, you can go to college. And so that's why I feel like this is such an important piece of legislation. Um, it just makes sense economically, but not only that, it's the right thing to do, right? So many youth who fall into a, a depression because they feel like they have nothing. So. I think passing the Dream Act would create so much hope for so many young. I'm constantly surrounded by 7th through 12th graders. Um, when, when you tell them that there is hope, that there is an opportunity for them to continue their education, it's like this amazing light that comes to their eyes because at home they're taught you don't have documents, you can't go to school. But when, when you're sitting there in a position of letting them know the opportunities and what they do have available to them, it's, it's, no, it's not ending for them there. It's, they're going to continue until they, they make it. Thank you. Here's a question that's kind of interesting that is a little different from our audience. If you were a victim of or a witness to a crime while you were growing up undocumented, did you or would you report it? Have you ever had that question posed to you before? I presume that if you did report it, it could jeopardize your status. Has anybody been faced with that issue? Well, I, 
it, this didn't happen to me in, in my younger age. This actually happened to me, um, was it last summer, two summers ago? There was a, there was a march in DC and it was for the DREAM Act. And um, I was with two friends that are documented and we were on our way to DC. Um, and while we were there, um, a semi truck crashed into the back of our car and um, well, of course, we were okay, but we, we did have to pull over and we did have to make sure that, you know, everyone was, was, was fine. Um, it was really funny. It, now that I, that I think about it, it's kind of funny. Um, my friend who was in the back seat, he didn't necessarily want to call um, because he wasn't sure how they were going to react to me and how things are going to go down. Um, my friend who was driving, she was too afraid because of the shock from the accident that we had just had mm. and she couldn't call. So I ended up calling the police um, and, and reporting what had happened. Um, but uh, the first thought that, that came into my mind was, well, if, if they ask me for, for documentation, what, what do I give them? Do I, do I take out my Mexican ID? Do I take out my, my college ID? What, what do I do? Mm. Um, thankfully, uh, the, the police in Pennsylvania were very sweet, and um, and uh, they they didn't um, have any issues with with what I, I presented to them. Um, but it it is something that that comes up whenever whenever you think about like uh, talking to to officials um, because you, you do worry about your status and if they'll associate your status with your family. So it's, I guess, mm -hmm. that, that goes with... Good. Thank you. I have a that. perfect story in that Please. situation. Uh, I, I think a year, year and a half ago, I, I got a call from my cousin. Um, that, and um, her father had been in, an, in somewhat of a car accident, very minor. I think he touched the other bumper of the other car and did a little scratch. And I get on the phone with her, and she tells me, Carlos, Carlos, you got to talk to this guy. Uh, because he was saying that he was going to call immigration on my uncle uh, because of the little scratch and that you have to pay all this money. And ended up that, you know, I couldn't calm him down, but my uncle had to pay him a large sum amount of money cash there at that moment so he wouldn't call immigration. Uh, and you can say that, it, I mean, it's, it's a total advantage of the situation that he was in. And then what do you do from there? How do you report it? Mm -hmm when you've yeah. been taking advantage like that. And I think also something that Isabel and I were talking before was that because of the current policies of immigration, the current collaborations between the local police and immigration, many immigrants are forced to not say anything or not even collaborate with the police because people don't know if, if you're gonna call anybody if you know, they're actually gonna enforce the law on the person that did the crime or gonna enforce the law on you. Especially if you're a young mother or a young father you know, we seen, I think we recently heard the statistics that there's more than 5,000 children uh, that are currently in the foster care system because their parents have been deported and there is no way that the parents can get them back. There's actually one case in North Carolina of a father uh, that the mother was deported and then he was deported. The two children are in custody of foster care and the state is taking the father, even though the father is in Mexico, cannot get the children back is putting him on trial so he loses all the rights and they can be adopted by another family. Yeah. That's happening to 5,000 families across the country. And actually, I think uh, one of the, actually a case that's, you know, the, of somebody calling the ambulance, calling an ambulance, and because of that, uh, yeah. he's in deportation proceedings. You know, imagine, you know, how many crimes, imagine uh, being witness to, you know, to a rape or child molestation and, you know, Yes, the courage is there, but imagine like knowing that, that the possibility that someone may not call that, you know, that, that person who, you know, who, you know that someone who just molested a little child, just someone who somebody did a horrible crime, can get away just because our system forces good people to stay silent. Thank you. Here's another question from our audience. If tomorrow, next week, next month, God forbid, you were picked up by immigration authorities, what is the first thing you would do? I mean, is there, 
Are you <laughs> advised? We would start an education at deportation campaign, a public campaign saying, please don't deport Isabel or don't deport Rosa. <laughs> and we would ask everyone to sign our, the petition to make a call to ICE. Um, and that's the reality. A lot of undocumented youth are put in deportation proceedings for minor things like a broken tail light or speeding. I mean, how many of us haven't sped, right? Um, but families are being separated for the smallest things. And that's why we feel like, you know, if people know your situation, uh, there will be help out there. So that's what I would do. I think I'd call Cesar. <laughs> He's our lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> they got my number. Anybody else, what you would do if suddenly you were picked up? And I think there's something related to that in terms of, like, undocumented youth and where we are. You know, what we're basically doing here is, you know, making sure that we are giving a voice to our parents or to young dreamers who are not, not public with their stories. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, that undocumented youth have taken now is to, just like the civil rights, you know, doing civil disobedience action. Because it's not because we want to cause trouble. Because one, you know, we're undocumented and unafraid. No more fear. And second, if, if we're going to get deported, it's going to be under our terms, not anyone else. It's not going to be because of fear. It's going to be because we're challenging an unjust system. We're challenging a policy that's just completely economically wrong. Now, this is a last question that I have, and then I'm going to ask each of you to take just a minute or two to make whatever statement you would like about um, your own situation, what you would like to see happen in this country, or whatever you would like to say to the audience as a, sort of your, your last statement of this evening. But let me give you this question because I think it's a good one. Um, do you worry about your family and its future, those who are here in the United States with you, but who, like most of you, are undocumented? Do you worry about your family for those of you whose parents are undocumented? I worry about my parents all the time. Um, I don't worry so much for me. I worry about my parents all the time because um, they've worked every single day of their lives here um, and I would just hate for them to um, for anything to happen to them knowing that they've contributed so much to this country um, but I, I do I do worry about my family all the time actually I was talking to Carlos last mm -hmm. night about this and, and I, I do too I worry about my parents all the time and I I couldn't have the courage that my mother had when she was 22. You know, I, I, can't, I don't see myself doing the same things that, she's do, that she did when she was my age. So yeah, you worry about your family all the time. Anyone else? I'd have to say when I'm home and sometimes I'll call my sister, and she, unfortunately she's in the same situation, and I'll call her and she'll say, oh my God, Isabel, there's a police right behind me. I have to hang up. Like, just the fear in her voice just to see somebody. And she has two children that were born here, and she has to work, and she has to provide food for my little nephews. Um, and so it's a real situation. It's very scary. And my mother, she hasn't... I haven't seen my grandfather for 21 years. And so I'm not getting any younger. I don't know about you all, and my grandfather's not getting any younger. And just to think that if something were to happen, like, am I going to be able, or is my mother going to be able to go back to Mexico and see her father for the last time? Or if she does, she's never going to be able to come back. And so it's really hard to have to live in that situation and to know that even though the, my home is here, I have loved ones that if, any, if anything were to happen, then I'm probably not going to be able to go back and say my last goodbye. And I've, I've seen many um, individuals having to go through that. And so it's really hard. Thank you. Well, I hope you've gathered your thoughts here because I want to ask each of you to say whatever's on your mind. We've had some excellent questions. I think all of you have done a brilliant job answering them. But let me start with Rosa. 
If I could, Rosa, is there anything that you would like to say here tonight to our audience and to those listening in? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for being here, uh, especially uh, listening to what we have to say. Um, we are not criminals. We, we want to contribute. I want you to take what you heard tonight, take it home, soak it in, and help your community, inform your community, declare your right to dream, because everybody has the right to dream. I think one of my last thoughts is I'm still actually very uh, astonished by the greenness of this state. And, like, <laughs> really. But, like, everyone I met, like, just walking across the, I guess, the campus, you know, everybody's so, you know, it's just, you know, this, this is my, my neighbors. And this is, you know, what we're going through. It's, it's something that is it's not just us versus them. It's us. And we are in a we are in a in a battle for for really for the for the spirit of our families for the spirit of our community. So, really, this battle that we're in is it's it's you know it's like I mentioned before. It's it's you, there's two people. There's two types of people. People who you know make things happen. They act. And there's people who watch. And I know everyone in this room. And I know the University of Arkansas. I know Arkansas are people who act and don't stand on, on the sidelines. So just, I ask you, just, you know, this is our fight. Let's win it. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for all of you for being here. Um, I think what I would like to say, this is something I say it all the time, and more than anything, I think I would like you to take the story of my young brother. I don't know how many of you here are the oldest in your family, if you can raise your hand maybe. So I think all of you can understand what it means to be the responsible one for the family. And I have a brother, he's a graduating right now, I mean in this year from, uh, from high school. But a couple of years ago, he came in into my room uh, in the second floor of my home and he had a letter that uh, he had gotten in the mail and he was extremely excited with um, the, you know, the joys of when you're a teenager with that kind of excitement that you can take over the world. And he comes into my room and he reads me the letter. And it's a letter that says, Dear Rodrigo, uh, you had been accepted for a free scholarship to go to China. You can do anything. You know, we'll pay for everything. You're gonna get, and my brother loves that side of the world. And because of the work that I have been doing and all of us have been doing, my brother thought, well, he could do anything. And he looks at me and I'm standing up. He's uh, sitting down, he puts the, his big eyes like uh, the cat from Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> and he looks at me like that and he says, he just asks the simplest question that I ask myself every day. Carlos, can I go? And you know, as I looked at him, I, I couldn't say yes to him, so I had to say no very bluntly to him because uh, that was the truth. Uh, but I felt like uh, I broke his heart and I broke my heart and I don't think that needs to happen anymore across the country. Um, so I will tell you, take the story of my brother, take the story of all of us here, take the story of all of our families. Uh, we do have the right to an education and people do have the right to dream and to be whoever they wanna be. This is America, so thank you. Yeah. Thank Thank you. Anytime. Thank you. We'll save that for the next forum. All right. Zesta? Yes, sir. I would just like to say that right now we are making history 
this event here mm -hmm. in Arkansas is a history-making event. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to um, just ask all of you, and I do challenge all of you, to do the right thing. Because right now, we are, we are talking about this openly. But we need to continue this conversation out in public with people who don't know about the DREAM Act, people who don't know what undocumented is. This is a conversation that needs to keep going. This is a huge step, but we need to keep going and we need to keep the momentum moving um, because we, we, we just can't sit here and wait and talk about the DREAM Act and talk about how wonderful it is and how wonderful it would be for all of us to eventually get citizenship. We need to take action and I do challenge all of you to continue doing this and continue talking, but also um, for those of us who haven't registered to vote, to register to vote as soon as possible. Because I may not be able to vote, but my sister can, my cousins who are citizens can. I may not be able to vote and have my, my voice heard, but I know at least 10 other people who can. And if by working a network that way, we can, change, we can change minds and we can change laws. So I challenge all of you to please do the right thing and to continue this conversation going outside of this scenario. Thank you. Jonathan. Um, I mean, like, I was detained for four weeks and it's, it's been a hard, uh, life, I think for all, everybody who's undocumented, like there were times I didn't have any food or a place to stay. Uh, but you know, Jesus has made this amazing for me and, I, and God has helped me so much and I love God because of that and I know that I'll be okay uh, no matter what happens. Like God gives me the faith to know that he's above the government and I'll be okay. Um, but I will say that um, for anybody who's undocumented or anybody who's struggling uh, to know that there is a way, you know, we can fight for our education. We, I mean, we don't take free stuff, we earn it. Uh, we fight hard and we try to open doors. Um, so just, I think whenever you put a face to it, whenever you're able to understand uh, what we go through, like uh, every single one of us and every single story, uh, it's just, it's different. You make it personal. So I would encourage you to just find more stories and um, find more ways to support people like us who really want to make a difference. Um, so thank you, guys. I love Arkansas. I think I was born in Peru, but I will forever say that I'm from Arkansas. So yes. thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, well, thank you all so much for listening to our stories. And immigrant rights are human rights. And so what, choose, what side are you going to choose? Are you going to be on the right side of justice or are you going to silently join our oppressor? And so I urge you all to, again, take action and to, to be on the right side of justice. Well, we hear a lot these days about um, immigration issues, but rarely do we get to hear from people whose lives have actually been touched by it. So I want to say to Isabel and to Jonathan and to Cessna and to Carlos and to Cesar and to Rosa, we thank you. You have our deepest gratitude for coming tonight. We appreciate it very much. And would you please show your appreciation again to them? Thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if nothing else, I hope we have at least uh, moved the dialogue a little further. Regardless of how you feel about the issue, I want you to know that we are sincerely grateful to you for coming tonight. Um, we thank again our panelists. We thank you. We thank the people that have helped put this together. And I hope that you will have a safe journey home. Thank you very much. <laughs>